All right, ladies, welcome to a very special episode of the She is Extraordinary podcast. Today, I am here with high performance coach and business mentor, Stacey Tushel. An entrepreneur since the age of 18, Stacey's made a name for herself as an expert in growing small business. Besides her thriving online coaching business, she owns a million dollar dance studio business in her home state of Wisconsin. She's a best selling author. You've got to get her books, the founder of the Foot Traffic Formula, and the host of Foot Traffic podcast. In 2019, Stacy was named Wisconsin's Small Business Person of the Year. She's been featured in Inc. Magazine, Huffington Post, among others. She's appeared on many other popular podcasts, including Eventual Millionaire, Online Marketing Made Easy with Amy Porterfield, and so many others. And of course, she's a mama to two adorable little girls. Please join me in welcoming a truly extraordinary lady to the show, Stacey Tushel. How are you doing, Stacey? Hi, Judy. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited and looking forward to this. Oh, thank you. Stacey, I've been following you for years. I have been a past client of yours as well. And what struck me about you from the very beginning was your no nonsense yet relatable substantive content. Like you're always pouring such value out. So ladies, if you're not following Stacey, you've got to be okay. But for those who don't know you yet, can you just briefly share your entrepreneurial journey about how it all began? Yeah, absolutely. So I started already, this is 19 years ago, I was right out of high school, I started teaching dance classes in my parents backyard. And it really was just going to be this hobby, me really to pursue dancing for a little bit longer while I'm in college, going to get a degree to get a real job. And that first summer, we had 17 dancers, I was really excited. I'm like, Oh, enough for a team, this is gonna be fun. Within three years, we had 100 kids signed up. All of a sudden we're doing, you know, additional levels and can my sister join in? We did different age groups and thankfully I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. So my parents and grandparents have been in the construction business for over 50 years. And as they were watching me, they're like, we don't know anything about dance, but this kind of looks like this could actually be a business and you could, you could do this. And I incorporated back in 2005 started my own studio. You know, now we have two. Um, We own both the buildings that they're in like million dollar custom buildings. We own those. We've got about 50 employees that work in the business on a day-to-day operation and grossing over a million dollars a year. And it just, it's just crazy that that backyard story has turned into this. And it kind of sparked other people saying, could you teach me? Could you share more? How did you do it? What did you do? And that's kind of what birthed foot traffic. And I just, I love talking business. Like Judy, you know me, I, I could talk business all day long. It lights me up. And I love sharing like what worked and what didn't. I'm super honest. I'm an open book. You can ask me anything and I might not know it, but I'll share with you what we've done or how we've gotten through that or what I would do if that were to happen to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just an amazing story. I just want to hit on something that I wasn't going to, but now that you mentioned it, it kind of sparked it on. Your, you know, your upline, for lack of a better word, your ancestors are entrepreneurs. My dad was a factory worker and mom stayed home. So it's a whole different thing. I'm just curious. Do you think that growing up in that entrepreneurial lifestyle, do you think that had an impact as to how you're able to pick things up? I'm just curious yeah. yourself on that. You no, know, I mean, I have two sisters and they're not entrepreneurial, right? So I think it's, it's the way that we're wired, right? And, you know, I always think back to my mom and my grandmother, they were more helping the, the fam. they're, they're, um, the way that they really contributed was they took care of us and they made sure that food was on the table. So when our dad and grandfather got home, at really late at night, that's, we could eat and be together and all of that. So, you know, I always wonder, like, I wonder what women in the family were entrepreneurial, but didn't get to show that off because it just wasn't something that was normal and that people did. So I think it definitely played a part. It showed me that it was possible, but I think a lot of the times too, I watched the men work. I didn't really see, I saw mom and grandma stay at home full time, taking care of everything. So it's funny how, you know, we see things differently. And, you know, even if you were to ask my sister, how we grew up, it probably would be different than what I would have recalled or, you know, Um, but I'm sure, yes, it had to have played a part in the way that I saw them make things happen and build things and talk about business at the table and all of that. Mm, I totally get that the way you're wired, like during those yeah. dinner conversations, you were probably listening in a way that maybe your sisters didn't because yeah, God, made probably. You yeah, absolutely. Well, after working with hundreds and hundreds of clients, I know even during the past several years that women CEOs love to say they're busy, 
yeah. right? They almost take pride in, I'm so busy. Mm-hmm. They wear it almost as a badge of honor. But the goal, of course, as an entrepreneur is not to be busy for the sake of being busy is to be productive and ultimately to generate revenue. So I would love for you to talk about that. What is the difference, Stacey, between yeah. being busy and being productive? Yeah. And right now I would say I'm being busy. And I say that in a way that I'm a little embarrassed to admit it, if mm. that makes sense, right? Wow. So you get caught up, right? Or, or you get to a different level of, wow, what used to be productive for me is no longer productive for me. This shouldn't be on my calendar. Why am I allowing that to be there when I have to now focus on different things, right? So I always go back to like the root word of productivity is to produce, right? To produce. And a lot of times we can work, there are people that work way more than me, but they get less done than I do. Or maybe they produce more items or tasks off their plate, but unfortunately it wasn't moving the needle. It didn't make a change in their business. So Mm -hmm. every time I'm working with people on my team, managing, leading, I'm, I'm always asking them, but what are the actual numbers that are going to make a difference for us? Like that's the stuff that I need to be seeing. That's the stuff that I need to be focusing on. I don't need to see how many Instagram followers we got this week. I just don't because that doesn't equate to dollars in our bank account. What I do need to see is what are people moving on? What are they clicking? What are they um, going to the next level? I need to see the stuff that actually makes a difference in our business. So I think we have to remember there's a lot to get done. You will never be able to check off everything on your to-do list. Not if you're a business owner. It just, it never stops, right? Thank you for saying that. It's true. Never. Yeah. Yeah. And I always tell people, you just have to get really good at being okay with not finishing that list. And that our brains are wired to check things off. Our brains are wired to complete things and and to have it be finished. But as an entrepreneur, you are never, ever finished. And in the middle of trying to check off your to-do list, you create another one and another one. And then you're like, you know, I don't even want to do that thing anymore. Let's scrap it. Let's start over, right? So you have to just be okay with it not being complete, not being finished. And instead of trying to get, 10 out of 10 things done today or 12 out of 12 or whatever that is, or even seven out of 10, just get the biggest things done that will make the biggest difference. And that might be checking off one thing out of 10 things, Mm -hmm. right? Two things out of 12 things. So just be careful. You're not getting caught up in just the doing and the hustle of it all. Yeah. Love that. Love that. So you mentioned just now about the metrics. Yeah. And so I would love you, if you would, to just high level that as the CEO that's, you know, making six figures and they're looking to get it to the next level, what yeah. type of numbers should they be tracking? So it's different for everybody. And people always want to know, what are you tracking? Like, what are you? And, I, and you can, I can tell you and I can share that. But if we have different business models, it probably isn't going to benefit you. Right. So I always say to people first, let's, let's start with the end in mind. Where are we trying to go? What are we trying to get? What kind of customers, what kind of products are we trying to sell? Okay, what are the things that is achieving that growth? What are the things you are doing that is actually making that sale? And then you start to look at, okay, well, if it, and this is where it gets interesting. So let's say you decide, oh, wow, it's coming from organic Facebook. Like we are killing it on Facebook. It's doing really well. Instagram is not doing that well, but I always hear like people are doing well on Instagram So I'd really like to focus on going into Instagram and getting those people, right? And I always tell people, why are you, you've got a winner, you've got something working. And here we are saying, no, thank you. Let me find a different way, a harder way of of, a place that I've been trying to do, but I'm actually not doing well. People always throw away the good stuff. They throw away the things that, and, and the good stuff is really mediocre. The good stuff we haven't even poured enough time and energy to it to make it great, right? Mm-hmm. So you're, you're not even, and I say Facebook and Instagram, you fill in the blanks with what you've been doing or where you want to go, but we all have it. We're all like, oh, I've been hearing TikTok ads. So we're already thinking about TikTok. We, don't, we haven't even mastered Facebook or Instagram, right? Yeah. So I, I, want, I want you to ask yourself, where are our customers coming from? How do we lean in to that? How do we start to track? Now you might say, I don't even know where they're coming from. I've never been tracking that. Well, when you start to track where they're coming from, that knowledge is going to give you the information to say, okay, wow, I had no idea. We have one person that shouts us out. And a lot of our people are coming from her. Imagine if you were to say, hey, I'd love to do some sort of partnership or collaboration or 
Instagram swaps where I shout you out one week and then you shout me out the next week. We just do it for free, right? Imagine if you knew that data and that's when it gets interesting, right? When you can start to see that. So you keep reverse engineering. Okay, great. Well, that's where the customers are coming from. Where are the leads coming from, right? Where are, where are people all of a sudden discovering us? And you go backwards. You don't start with top of funnel, which everybody thinks you start at the top, right? You actually start at the bottom. Mm, love you it. Work your way back. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. That is so good. And ladies, if you aren't tracking this, like where are my customers coming from? That should be job number one, because then you're, everything you do is going to be targeted and strategic. And you ladies know I love strategy. All right. So Stacey, I know you're a big fan of systems, working yeah. smart. I mean, that's what you're known for. So I'm curious, have you always been that way? Or did you have to kind of teach yourself along the way? Yeah, I would say no, of course not. I mean, I don't know how many people are completely wired to, to, to know. And that's the thing. It's like, even if you're wired to be a doer, you don't necessarily know what is going to be impactful. So we all waste time, right? Especially in the beginning. So I definitely think I started to hit those pain points of, wow, I'm working way longer than I want to be, or I don't want to be answering the phones on a Saturday night or returning, waking up Monday morning and returning all of these calls. And right. So I think your biggest frustration starts to help you create the systems in place for better boundaries, for better systems, right? For saying, I don't want to be the person checking the info at email. I'm going to give that over to somebody else. I'm going to hire a customer service rep, right? So I think the biggest thing that you can do right now is to be aware of what is actually going on in the business and what are you, what lights you up and what really frustrates you? What are you like, you kind of almost, you wake up and you look at your calendar and you're like, oh, I have to do that today, right? Those are the things where you start to go, that's what I need to get off my plate. That's what I need to outsource. And why? Because when you already dread it, dreading anything, you will never produce amazing results, right? Mm -hmm. You want somebody who doesn't dread it, they light up over that activity. And that's, I think the biggest thing is, is just like that delegation and knowing it's not just you that has to do everything, right? But really taking those things off your plate. And I know somebody's thinking, but I don't have the money. I can't do it. There are so many amazing ways to get people. First of all, it could be as little as five hours a week, right? So money doesn't have to be full-time employee. Uh, we, have, we have interns that work for us for free for just college credit that are ecstatic to come work here. You don't have to have money to have people work with you, right? So there, you've got to get creative here. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. Where, where would you say, as far as these um, college students, for example, yeah. can we go right to uh, the college itself? Or, you know, tell us a, bit, a little bit about, for anybody that's never done that, I have yeah. done that. Okay. But- so every college and university, university is different. I have emailed, uh, I won't even say which school it is here, but I have emailed a very big school here and I have gone to the person that would be in charge of this. And I've literally said, I am at the time I was like, I am the Wisconsin small business person of the year. Okay. I am somebody who, when they come here and work, my goal is to be able to offer them a job when they're done working here. So immediately get them a job working for a company that clearly knows what we're doing. Hmm. That email no responses, nothing, no acknowledgement of receipt of that email to somebody who's in charge of the interns at this, this school. So I share that because you've got to, you've got to reach out. You've got to talk to it's just like collaborations, mm-hmm. the right people, the right opportunity. It's not going to be everybody. You're going to do this and you might do it once. And that's why I say this to you. And you might get no response and think, well, that doesn't work. Stacey's strategy doesn't make sense. Right? No, no, no. I have had to message several places. And then all of a sudden, again, you're like, Ooh, wow, we got one from this school. Mm-hmm. Let's go back. Yeah. Let's not yeah. try to get the school where they're not responding. Let's go to the place that they're actually giving us people and let's keep working with them. So I would say really start to, at first, every state is different. You may be in a state where free interns are never, it's not even legal, okay? Free interns for college credit. So check that and see, because I, I do think it's nice to be in your state if you can. If you're going, great, I'm in this state and they don't do that. Well, the good news is remote internships are now a thing. So we have people right now, one of our interns is from Indiana. We're Wisconsin. So don't think I can't do this. I'm in one of those states and it doesn't allow it. Nope. Great. You can get remote. And, Mm -hmm. And that's another huge opportunity, especially when schools are 
closing and shutting down, they're excited when they can offer an internship that isn't going to close, that they get to work no matter what the situation is with the pandemic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. And ladies, I just want you to like think about what Stacy just said. You need to think outside the box. Today, with all that we have, our we have access to at our fingertips, LinkedIn, search career services or head of intern at a college, reach out. Um, there's lots of ways to be diligent. And as Stacy said, find the right people. And if you want to hire local, there's nothing better than the networking and getting it, you know, find out where they are. Hey, where do they hang out and where can I go? So um, don't let little things like, oh, this is a little bit of a blockade or this is a little hurdle. Okay. This is the entrepreneurship. <laughs> it is one hurdle after another, right? Yeah. So, Awesome. And one of the things too, we had somebody who we hired and she wasn't an intern for us, but she was an intern before she came to us. So picking her brain, how did you apply? Where did you find out? Who is your contact? Do you have an email for that person? Right. Mm-hmm. Even just asking people that are local to you or putting a post on Facebook. Hey, anybody know anybody in college right now doing an internship? They'll connect you with their, those people. Yeah. Great, great idea. All right. I want to make sure that the ladies that to whom systems, it's kind of like a word that's thrown around a lot and they may not even know what we're talking about. So there's this systems versus processes. Can you help flesh that out a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So first of all, people that, that is one of the biggest questions I get. I don't, I don't really even know what a system looks like and I don't know how to even start creating them. I hear it, but I don't know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So first of all, the goal here is that you are not a solo entrepreneur forever. Why? Because there are many things in your business that you don't want to be doing and you don't want to have to have the business need you to run, right? So you're going to want to hire somebody at some point. When you hire them, you want to make sure that the level of what you've been doing is exactly the same when they do it. And the way that you do that is by putting systems into place so that they know how this is done and how this happens. Now, If you're not in a place to hire somebody, I always tell people, great, because the best time to set up systems is before you hire them, not when you need to. Now, if you're going, great, I actually do need to hire somebody, that's fine. You just have to do some work before you go to hire them so the systems are in place, right? So let's say this is an easy one that everybody has had to do or will do, and that is removing yourself out of the customer service inbox. One of the biggest reasons I tell people don't go in here is because an entrepreneur should only be checking their email once or twice a day maximum and in the afternoon or later. A good customer service email inbox is checking the email many times a day and definitely first thing in the morning, right? Yep. That means you can't stay there as the customer service rep. But if you're doing it now, here's what you could be doing. As questions start to come in, if you've ever worked your customer service inbox, you know it's the same questions over and over and over. How can you start to set up a template where every time somebody were to ask you about a certain thing, you start to craft that template so that you can start to grab those in the future. It makes it faster for you. But when you go to hire, imagine if you said, oh, and by the way, here are 10 most frequently asked questions you're going to get. And here are the responses, what you can say. You can edit it, modify it to what actually is being said. But here's a great base. Oh my goodness, the newbie who you've just hired, who is normally very overwhelmed is thinking, wow, this is really cool, really organized. And she or he is going to feel more confident that they're going to be able to complete the task. That's Mm -hmm. the kind of person you want jumping in because of your systems and processes. So they help in the beginning when you are doing it. Cause imagine if you were, how many times have you written the same email over and over <laughs> and you could just have that template saved right inside of Gmail, right? They have something called templates where you can save these. So imagine if we've sped you up and then when you were ready to hire somebody, you already had those 10 emails ready to go. The training process is so much smoother. Does that help? Yeah, that's super. And ladies, trust me when you imagine if you hire someone and you present them with these processes already in place. There's a confidence, as Stacy mentioned, where number one, they're impressed with you. Yes. And I think it, the nerves would go away. They'd be more confident saying, wow, I really love who I work with. She's smart. She's sharp. And all of a sudden she's more motivated to Absolutely. make sure that she performs for you. So, well, and I will say too, we forget that we're trying them out as much as they're trying us out, Right. When you bring somebody into your business and it's a hot mess, and I say that with all the love because I still think our business is a little bit of a hot mess in certain areas, right? We're a work in progress, like many people listening. Well, when they come in and they're going, whoa, this is a hot mess. 
And I don't really know if this business is going to be for me or if they're even going to be around in six months because it looks so unorganized. People want security. They want to know and feel like this is a great decision, right? It's kind of like that buyer's remorse. You buy a product, a program, service, and you're like, oh, shoot, should I have bought this? And the way that that person who sells you, that next step that they take, it reassures you or it reassures you made a good decision or it scares you into thinking, oh, my goodness, I don't think I made a good decision. That is happening with the people that come on our team. They're saying, okay, wow, this, this is exciting. She looks organized. I think I'm going to be able to stay here a long time and grow and climb the ladder. Or, wow, I'm not sure if I made the right decision. And we do not want our people thinking that, especially in the first 90 days when they come here. Right, right. As leaders, you've got to get this, you know, and I love, Stacey, I love that you're real. I mean, look how, look how, look where you are in business. And you're saying, well, there's parts of my business that are still a hot mess. So I love it. And it's funny because sometimes we'll have podcast listeners or people that followed me, they will apply. So they are, they know me from the outside and they're, they're probably expecting a certain level. Right. And I have to warn somebody it's probably a little messier than you think it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Of course, on the outside, we want to look like perfection but perfection doesn't exist Mm -hmm. and not with a growing company. We are growing so quickly at foot traffic. There is no way we could be organized because we didn't even have certain positions. Like today we have a position we didn't have a year ago. We had to create the whole position, the systems, everything. How in the world could we be just like picture perfect on the inside? We can't. So we have to set that expectation of it's not perfect. That's why you're here to help us build out these systems or to be able to do this. And together we're going to create this and imagine what we're going to be a year from now, right? You share the exciting stuff and that's what keep the vision is what keeps people staying with you and getting excited. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to address the F word now, yeah. fear. Mm-hmm. It holds so many back. And so I would love for you to share three ways to help people work through the, that fear. Yeah. So The first one, and we probably could stop right here because the first one is you do it anyway and you get comfortable. Mm -hmm. So last night, my little ones were watching a YouTube family and this little girl climbed all the way up to this crazy big ladder. I don't even know how tall it was. And she jumped off into the water from this probably like 10 foot ladder. Now she didn't do it right away. It took her a long time before she could jump in. And then she finally did it. And I, I paused the show and I said, okay, what are we learning from this? Right. Cause all of a sudden it took her forever to want to jump in. And then she finally jumped in again, again, again. It was like, now she climbed the ladder and jumped it again, did it again, did it again. And I said, what's the lesson. Right. And that they caught it. Like they're, they're six and eight. And they caught the lesson of when she finally just did it, even though she was afraid, it wasn't that scary. In fact, it was fun. Mm -hmm. So now she did it again and again. So how much time did she waste standing up at the top of the ladder, not jumping when she could have been jumping, having fun. And they're like, oh my goodness, she should have done it right away. Right. And those are the lessons we teach entrepreneurs, right? Those are the lessons. If you could just do it, if you could just get on camera and do it anyway, if you could just hire that employee or buy that program you've been waiting for, or start the podcast, you've been dying to start. If you could just do it, And know that, of course, it's going to be messy. Of course, you don't know what you're doing. You've never done it before. You don't know what it feels like. You don't know what you're going to need. But the fastest way to find that out is by doing it and moving forward. And as you do it, it's less scary. Mm -hmm. I've been interviewed. I don't even know how many times. I mean, hundreds. I was scared out of my mind for interview number one. (laughs) Scared out of my mind. So bad. Like, just incredible, right? But I finally did it way longer than I should have. Finally did it. And then I was like, oh, okay. It wasn't, I was a little nervous, but it wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do another one, right? And now I'm doing several a week and I don't even think about it. I I knew it was you today. And I was like, oh, cool. I know Judy, this will be fun. And it's just, it's easy (laughs) now. After I've done it hundreds of times, of course it's easy now. It was not easy in the beginning. And that's what I want people to see. So that's the biggest one is is just how to get through it. Just do it anyway. Mm -hmm. I think another thing we can share is, um, really, and this is hard for me. And I say this, and I know I'm still not perfect at it either, but not caring what people think, right? So many times you're being held back because what are they going to think? What are they going to say? And, and allow, and really working through it. I've had that moment of like, oh, but they are going to think this. Okay, great. So when they think that, then what happens, right? And you kind of work down that rabbit hole. And then one of the questions that somebody asked me that was game changer for me in my mindset was, 
what are they going to think if you did the opposite? Like, and the, the, the strategy behind this was when somebody thinks negatively of you, they go the negative route, no matter what you do. Mm. So if you're making a ton of money, they're going to talk bad about you. If you're broke, oh, believe me, they're going to talk bad about you, right? They don't want to see you broke or see you making a lot of money. They're just going to do it no matter what. And when I realized that, I was like, oh my goodness, you're, I'm trying to get people to like me that are never going to like me. So why Mm -hmm. not just let me like me and like the results that I'm getting and not care about those other people. Mm -hmm. It still is hard. This is not a perfect strategy, but I do care less. And I walk into something like, eh, let, let them talk, right? Yeah. So that's, that's another big one too, I think, is that fear of other people. That's awesome. I want to interrupt just for just a moment because about two weeks ago inside my Thrive Academy on one of our weekly calls, I mentioned that. I said, ladies, it is so freeing to not care. And someone raised their hand and they're like, wait a minute, especially we're Christian. What do you mean we don't care? And I'm like, look, I love them and I care. But what I'm saying in the way that I don't care is that I'm not going to be so hesitant. I'm not going to not be me. Yeah. We're thinking that somebody might not like what I say because I've got to be me who God made me to be and speak my message. So ladies, 100%. if you're like, oh, no, no, that doesn't feel good about not caring, just go to God with that and say, Lord, help me to understand what Stacy and Judy are saying when they're saying, don't care. We care. I know mm-hmm. Stacy cares, yeah. but there's just some, maybe like a shell around yourself to protect yourself, to say, you know what? I've got to do what God has put me on this earth to do in the way that he tells me to do it and not worry about somebody else's criticism. Absolutely. We care for the wrong reasons. 100%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah so, good. so the third uh, way to help people. Yeah. So we've, we've talked about a a couple of good ones. I think the biggest thing at the end that I I really want to stress is you, we just talk about other people. Okay. But now let's go within, like, what is the fear of failure mean for you? And what are you allowing that to mean for yourself? Right. What are you telling yourself? Because the, the most important stories are the ones where we're repeating them over and over and over in our head, right? We don't get to escape them. So I really think if you could start to look at what am I telling myself and what does it really mean? And how do I start to change my thoughts? How do I start to replace that negative story with something more positive? Right. Um, I, I just, when you brought up Christian, my kids go to a Christian school and my friends were like, you got to get the Tesla X and it's the ones with like the spaceship doors open. And I said, my first reaction was, I could never take my kids to school and drop off, drop them off in that lane and have my spaceship door open and the kids get out. Like there's no way. And it's more so like, it's not like a showy school. It's not this private school where everybody's bragging about money. No, if anything, some people can't afford it, but they want their kids in Christian school that they will make it work. Right. And I'm like, oh, I could never do that. And my friend's like, you're thinking it's a negative thing, but what if you inspired some of those women those moms watching you and they saw what you were building and what you were doing. And maybe they were inspired to build their own business. And I'm like, Oh my goodness, I have made it. No one said anything about the spaceship doors, but me, I made it mean something. And now I'm holding that on. And I'm just assuming when I could be doing something even better and greater with that. Now I'm not getting the spaceship car just because I don't like it. Not because I'm afraid to pull in and the drive through, but that changed the game for me when they said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's so true. We assume what somebody else is thinking or what they may say. And that happens all the time on sales calls. As I work with my clients, we're like, well, what if they say this or that? Well, wait a minute. What if they say, oh my gosh, where do I sign up? And you know, this is great. So super. All right. Well, we need to wrap up, but you have a very special event coming up later this month. Drive more traffic bootcamp. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So this is something that I do where I really want to help people not just drive traffic, but learn how to get the right traffic that leads into sales. I always tell people, if you were, if you knew that you were going to go viral tonight, 6 PM, you're going viral. Would you sit here and just wait for all of the emails to come in and all the buyers? Or would you be working like a crazy person to get your profile looking great and your Instagram looking good? And there's a million things you have to do to catch up because you're not even ready to go viral, right? 99% of people are going to say, oh, I'd be working like a crazy person. I am not ready to go viral. And this drive more traffic bootcamp is so much more than just top of funnel driving traffic. It's getting you ready for that moment. And not that most of us are going viral, but it's getting you ready for that moment when just a handful of people come to your, your Instagram, your Facebook, see your ads, 
and it gets them to become a buyer because that's what we're doing, right? We're trying to serve at a higher level. So if you go to five day traffic bootcamp.com, all the details will be there. Um, we've got one coming up soon. So definitely come join us. It's completely free. Um, and I, I just, I'm so excited to help people. Like I said, get more visibility because you have such amazing products and things to share. And it's a shame that no one's seeing it, or at least not the amount of people we know should be. Right. And those right people. So ladies, I will be leaving a link inside the show notes. All right. Last question. Yeah. This is called the, she is extraordinary (laughs) podcast. So I would love for you to tell us about an extraordinary lady in your life and what makes her extraordinary. Mm, Oh, good question. Um, I'm going to mention somebody on my team. So Sarah on my team has come into our, our, world only 11 months ago. We actually just did her annual review. We did it early because she's about to leave and have a baby. And uh, so she's like fresh in my mind of just somebody we've said like, oh my goodness, how, how, how above and beyond she goes. She is somebody who takes ownership of everything she does and she's inspiring people. She's got this like tough love about her. She inspires them, but she also demonstrates and leads by example. Mm -hmm. And I love that about her. I think a leader should be okay getting their hands dirty and and no job is too good for them because I think we truly have to lead by example and Sarah absolutely hands down does that every single day. Beautiful. And I, what a neat thing that you just love one of your team members so much that you oh my goodness. Of her. I love that. my team. I feel bad even just picking one. Like <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're all extraordinary, which is why they get to work here and get to keep staying here. Um, but yes, I, we have so many amazing people that we're surrounded by. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, where can we tell the ladies to connect with you? Where's the best? Yeah, part? everywhere on social. I'm at Stacy Tushel. And then um, if you go to foottrafficformula.com, that'll be the easiest place you can actually sound out and spell because I know Stacey Tushel is like the hardest name, first and last name, um, but that will take you to our website and everything else. Okay, awesome. Well, Stacey, thank Thanks. you so much for sharing so your beautiful wisdom. So loved having you on. Thank you. Appreciate you so much, Judy. All right, ladies, thank you for listening. If you've loved this episode, please take a moment, leave a rating and a review and let me know of other beautiful guests that you would like to have on. So thanks so much for watching and we will see you next time.